to another video on Deep Digital. Let me start with a bit of housekeeping. The past weeks I've uh, been focused on creating a Dutch channel to get some local interaction going on. I still want to continue uh, with this Deep Digital uh, English channel, uh, but my focus will be on the Dutch because local is important. Um, the last weekend I was invited to uh, present at the Lean Agile uh, meetup in Belgium and I've made a presentation uh, about open innovation. So I've learned from that presentation and now I wanted to make a video that will, more, most of, of it will be similar to uh, the talk I had, but uh, I got some feedback and I'll been working on that. So basically the topic was digital wolf changing digital rivers and that's a reference to something that happened in Yellowstone Park where they reintroduced the wolves and uh, fascinating enough it uh, stabilized the riverbank. So how is that possible that uh, releasing wolves can stabilize rivers? To understand that we need to have a bit of more detail about the ecosystem dynamics. First of all, you add a new predator, so that will affect the other predators. Predators, of course, affect the herbivores, and the herbivores affect the primary resources like the plants and so the riverbank. So what we need to see is this uh, tropic cascade, that's how they call it. And um, I'm gonna go a bit more detail on what is happening there in Yellowstone. First of all, um, there was an ecosystem. It, the, the primary uh, hunter was the coyote, and they would hunt uh, pronghorns and smaller animals, and those are mostly grass-eating animals. The dominant herbivore was the elk, who wasn't hunted at all. And they also eat these more woody plants. And what you see, if you look at the woody plants, is that they are like the essential variable in the ecosystem. It's the woody plants that will, the roots will stabilize the, the stream of the river. Um, they will have berries that will actually attract bears as well. Uh, the, the branches are of course a space for birds and they are the resources for, for beavers. So you see that the, the, it's, it's basically the wooden plant that is the essential variable in the ecosystem. But the way that the ecosystem existed with the coyote as the, the, the dominant uh, hunter, uh, it, it led to a barren landscape because grass can go grow fast, but woody plants grow slow. And so the, the, you see that by re-entering the wolves, they will push out the coyotes. And therefore you see more uh, pronghorns and small animals that can uh, survive. The wolves will uh, prefer to hunt the elks because it's more meat and therefore reduce this population so that the woody plants get a chance of growing and um, because the, the pronghorns and small animals will not eat the woody plants and so you, you get like a, a balance in the ecosystem and what, what happens is that the whole ecosystem will, will become enriched. Now, this tropic cascades and it's not the only place uh, we, we, Yellowstone is not the only place, so I'll give another one with a Maritimian ecosystem where you can have a barren landscape of mussels. So it's important to, I'm, I'm emphasizing the fact that there is an existing ecosystem that is barren and because I want to go, get back on that later on. But in this ecosystem, we add starfish and the starfish can of course open the mussels and eat them and therefore reduce that population and you will see that there is this tropic cascade eventually leading to the algae that is the essential variable in the maritimian environment and that will create a whole enrichment but basically both the wolves and the starfish are the key uh, stone species so i'm gonna focus more on wolves and woody plants because it will relate to things we see in the lean agile communities and specifically uh, to, towards open innovation so what i want to emphasize is you can see the wolves as the entrepreneurs and the woody plants as the talent and it's it's important to see to to the left here 
that um, those are pioneers. They are pretty rough. They, it, 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 it's a hard uh, environment. Uh, they, they are capable of transforming. Um, in contrast, if you, if you look at the uh, coyote as the smaller nephew of the wolves, uh, the smaller nephew of the entrepreneur would be the manager. And I am not um, diminishing their, what they are doing. I mean, you, you also see they just create another kind of tropical cascade. So what they will, will lead to are executors, people who are really well at, at following orders. And it's important. I mean, you, you don't want to have everything woody. If you think about a, a, a very dense forest, it's dark. Right, it, and if you look at talent, so why are why do I emphasize that talent is this? Uh, you you need to compare it with wood because they are stubborn. They appear to be very stubborn. They're, they're very hard to to change. But that's basically because they are so entwined or aligned with the creative space there and the thing they love that um, whenever you start talking to them, they can always move it back to their, their, their love, their, their creative space. So it appears as if they are not listening and it, it, it appears like a very hard discussion, talks, but basically it's because they're so much in love with the creative space they are in. And you don't always want that. If you go and look at corporate structures, you actually want people who can execute very well. And that's what I'm going to uh, talk about. It's uh, all going to show how... Um, Talent isn't really found in corporates and, and considered to hold these tropical cascades. There's going to be an interesting way to, to see how we can create a real rich ecosystem. So how do we work with that complexity? Okay, I'll, I'll move this up here. Um, spiral dynamics. Um, what we're going to look at is how um, and the organization actually and, and the mindsets of, of people is actually um, growing. And if you look at this uh, spiral dynamics, you'll see how you go from a, a basic arcane consciousness to, to a more advanced uh, uh, conscious. And um, what, I, what I want to uh, f see is that the, the spiral dynamics is like the front view. And it's easier to understand if you take a top view, if you take a horizontal view. And that uh, you can see with the, on the right side here. Uh, where you have this onion lay structure of organizations. And it shows a little bit the evolution of our organizations with uh, first pretty primitive um, uh, wolf-like uh, behavior. I mean, in, in, in this case, they compare it with mafia. I don't like that so much. I'll, I'll give a bad, an alternative right away. But what is important is you go from uh, survival of the fittest kind of situation to a governmental structure, to um, empires, to military structure, to discipline, to hierarchies, I mean, hierarchies in commands, right? Um, and um, that's been uh, very uh, fruitful in our uh, history for, for, for ages, like that's how the empires uh, ruled. But then you see, of course, that um, there's this industrial revolution. So that's the orange part where you see how machinery is actually disrupting this um, um, uh, bureaucracy. That b before the machinery, the, it's the bureaucracy that would rule. I mean, think about East Indian companies. Those are very bu bureaucratic uh, structures. While next uh, generation, you get into the industrial revolution. And today, of course, we talk about lean agile. We, we talk about uh, online communities. It's, it's, it's a new breed. And I will, I will look in a bit more detail on how corporates that have still often um, a, a very bureaucratic structure, how they try to enhance it a bit with technology, trying to get in that green area. That's, that's the thing most corporates are focused today. But we even can go beyond that. There are some niches, some cases where you can see that we go beyond the lean agile uh, movement and into what is called uh, a full self-management, a wholeness kind of uh, environment. We, we call them teal organization. And uh, the, the classical example is Buurtzorg. Uh, it is actually a very specific niche uh, case. And I'll, I'll going to give another case that's going to be a bit more technical, but that 
allows us to to bring it out of this um, narrative and into some um, more uh, applicable um, cases. So, first of all, looking at this first organizational layer where, where we have the wolf as our symbol, and I'm going to talk later about the digital wolf, but now I first want to see what is this wolf. Instead of talking about mafia, let's just uh, see that it's the entrepreneurial spirit. And it, it is a rough environment. Nature can be a tough um, uh, mentor, right? So basically, if you, if you need to compare it with an organizational structure, it's anarchy. Anything can go. That's the, that's the rule. Anything can go. And what you will see is that these entrepreneurs, therefore, actually will have very specific taste to talent. And uh, so why would an entrepreneur focus so much on talent? Because if, if you have something that truly can go deeper than anyone else can go, you have a competitive advantage. So that's a strategic benefit. And that's how you see that uh, entrepreneurs will actually deal with, with pretty tough people because they know they can create something that no one else can create. Okay. But just like with wolves, you need to understand that they hunt in, 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 as a team. And that's how you will see the creation of business ecosystem or startup ecosystems. And I will go in detail on one case. The main focus in, in this uh, setting is agile culture. And again, I will look in detail on how that happens with, um, with, with a digital case. Okay, so moving to the next level if you go to a um, uh, more uh, bureaucratic structure hierarchy you get into like a corporate uh, capital and um, so it's not anymore the entrepreneurial spirit now but now the main thing the, the keystone uh, is the the corporate capital and the way it looks it's like uh, an aristocracy right uh, it's c level in the organization that defines how the whole uh, mobilization needs to happen. So they will attract executors, people who are willing to conform to this, the need of the uh, corporate. So not the talent, right? Those are executors. So it's not woody plants and therefore what they need to create is scaffolds. And I, I see the difference between the, the wolves who go, who go hunting in this case to the, um, ec uh, the, the, the managers who go farming, right? And what they will do is like with the bean stack you see over here, uh, make sure that the bean can have optimal light. So they are helping the beans to actually be more fit. So that's, that's, that's the thing, the, the reason why capital is actually um, helping the executors and that you get this whole culture. Now, what you will see that, that corporates then focus on is called um, agile frameworks. And I'm gonna get into a few of them. The first I wanna talk about is Spotify. And I'll metaphorically talk, call it the story river because what it is capable of doing is a little bit like makeup. Now, um, wh when I talk about uh, uh, makeup, you, you need to see that if something, if someone is beautiful, right? And they use makeup, and, and Think about Kiss in uh, Kiss the, the the band because I I didn't want to go to for for women it, women it's quick easy but think about Kiss who who painted themselves uh, for their performance right um, so so it is if you're beautiful it can enhance it and that's what makeup is doing and that's what Spotify is capable of doing if you have a good culture you can actually um, enhance it and it's in and the, the, it's it as a story it's easy to understand. Uh, it's quick to adapt, but what I've noticed with the the the, uh, the companies I've been uh, working with is that they try to use Spotify to solve a cultural problem. And if your foundation is rotten, I mean, think about the, the bean stack. If the if the beans are sick, it doesn't matter if you create those scaffolds. They they they, they you need to first uh, heal the beans, right? So make the uh, metaphor complete, it's like putting makeup on a pig. So it can be useful, but just uh, keep in mind that it's enhancing something that's already beautiful. The second framework um, I want to talk about is SAFE. And there is 
there seems to be an irony in the safe case because if you if you go to the history of why are we doing agile development because we had a waterfall way of developing and it wasn't really for a software engineering environment it wasn't really a good model because the all you, you it, it software is a wicked problem and there's always something coming up and you need to adapt and change and that's why we moved to agile we moved away from the waterfall model that was a good model within big engineering projects but a bad model for software development now of course we are scaling up what you see is that um, agile in a big engineering company actually has a lot of use for this waterfall river in the sense that so uh, that that um, I, mean, I know that in aviation industry this is being used and i can see it also working in for for uh, quite technical medical equipment or for space travel uh, space uh, industry so there you would actually want a situation where um, at at a at a corporate level you cannot really uh, fail forward and um, i i mean i'm i'm actually uh, release train engineer certified so i actually like to help companies implement this but just make sure that uh, this is the thing you want to implement so again it's not changing the culture as well and it's very costly the third model i know about is less but to me it's a mystery river because i so far haven't encountered or collaborated with an organization who tries to implement it so if you are implementing it or if anyone uh, who, who is selling less to companies is interested to, to, uh, to, to get me and experience it, to understand how it's different to the other uh, frameworks, please reach out. I would love to understand better uh, what less can bring to the table. But if I look at it, all three of them, just from the, the architectural point of view, right? What you see is they will focus on the processes. They are focusing on the execution. And that's, of course, logical because, I mean, corporates are all about execution. So they are focused on the execution. But very often it's been implemented to, 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 uh, um, to try and solve a cultural problem. So they do want to get that agile culture in there, but that's not going to happen with the agile frameworks. So what, I'm, what I've tried with, well, tried with, we've uh, had some proof of concept uh, with a startup showing how we can start doing frameworks for culture. Because of course, there's a lot of literature out there uh, about strategic management and you can actually design around there uh, frameworks for culture and tools for culture. So it's both framework and, and, and tools because um, if you look at uh, Agile, we had Agile at team level and um, therefore there was tools on team level but if you're talking about culture culture is something that is actually happening at corporate level and there aren't that many, that many tools so we had to uh, create the frameworks and the tool at the same time uh, we had some interesting um, um, tryouts there were three companies willing to collaborate with us on that that was digipolis velokitas and globally so thanks to them we actually have the feedback to understand how, how we can improve that. And therefore we have like some um, um, scheme, let's say, uh, to, to move from a proof of concept to a minimum viable product. But the, the, the zeitgeist, uh, the, 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 the way uh, uh, venture capital was looking for opportunities didn't fit with what we were doing. So the idea that you could actually uh, create structure to to uh, help the culture uh, in 2016 at least in my network i wasn't capable of uh, attracting any venture capital who would be serious about that so if you would know any venture capital or whatever i mean please reach out i mean i already have the proof of concept uh, the thing we need now to to push this is is resources uh, someone who is uh, understand what i'm saying here so if you do reach out we talked about the, the, the wolves, we talked about the empires, uh, but then we need to move into uh, the industrial uh, area, right? So what we're going to see now is that um, the, the, it, it, so, so we had the entrepreneurial spirit with the, the first organizational layer. You had the uh, corporate capital with the second layer. What I see with the third layer is design thinking. 
It's basically science and design thinking that's been the, 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 the keystone force, like not species, but keystone force that has been um, making a tropical cascade. And it's a tropical cascade to what I like to call digital natives. And to compare it again with uh, going from hunter to farmer, what you see is here is the industrial version of that farming where we have fully understand how to optimize uh, the growing uh, of nutrients in these plants. And we, so, so you have these this systems and they, they, I mean, this is even a, a, a basic one. You've you got like really crazy uh, industrial versions of agriculture at the moment that are very uh, um, accurate. So what you try to do is with these digital natives, uh, you create technology, you create agile infrastructure and that's, that's uh, going beyond the agile um, uh, scaffolds, the agile frameworks. So I'm going to go into a specific case to talk about these agile infrastructures. Before I do that, I need to come back to the barren landscape. We talked about there were the coyotes with a barren landscape and there were the mussels with the barren landscape. So why would there be a barren landscape? Well, that's because on top of the wolves and the starfish, there has become a new keystone species. That's us, humans, right? I mean, today we are really understanding how we are a force that is um, 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 regulating the, 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 the atmosphere, right? So the climate change, it's on the table. Um, it, uh, we, we know it's a very complex, uh, complicated uh, um, uh, thing to understand, but if we start investigating a bit better the complex adaptive dynamics related to tropical cascades, we could actually figure out how we need to change our behavior so that we can create very rich ecosystem. Because the thing we've been doing so far is monoculture, right? And that's like with the coyotes and with the mussels, it's barren landscapes and we know it's not working anymore. So, but it's because we have pushed out complexity. So the question is, with all this new knowledge, can we pull in the complexity and start living in very rich ecosystems? So how do we do that? What is happening? How do we understand that? How can we be the keystone species to go to a very rich world? Today, we are in this barren uh, landscape. So what do we need to change and adapt? So I will talk about that specifically by looking in um, uh, concrete uh, uh, part, uh, uh, digital communities and, and what is happening. So I'll, I'll tell you about a case where these entrepreneurs uh, have been um, um, emerging, self-organizing. So it's open innovation purely by self-organization. So we get into that T level, right? Where, where we focus on self-management. So, but I'll, I'll show how that happened with uh, a, a, a startup ecosystem. And I will show how when the corporates get in, we actually get to this barren landscapes of, of, of the coyotes where we have managers and executors and they, have, they had a, a nice culture and they have tried to enhance it. Uh, but I'll tell a little bit uh, what happened there. What, what didn't happen, is the other way around, is understanding how adding humans to the equation and awareness and consciousness, and, I'm, and now I'm actually referring to very recent insights in, in, in the, the harder uh, questions around intelligence and artificial intelligence, but intelligence itself. And um, I'll, I'll argue that, that there's this zeitgeist and this zeitgeist appears to be uh, an energy field that actually uh, uh, has this tropical cascade to architects. And every time you see this onion layer of organizations increasing, we get into a new kind of, of, of architects. So now we are talking about this steel architects that are focused on how can we create this enrichment and the self-organization and instead of pushing out complexity, start dealing with complexity. And the, like I said, with the, the executors, we can see this gardening, right, which are weak plants. With the entrepreneurs and the talent, we can see these, these woody plants, which are hardened plants. Well, and, and that's going to be probably a little bit uh, once bridge too far for many. 
But what we are looking at from a research perspective um, to the next layer is uh, the awakening of a goddess called Gaia. Um, we mean the, the research institute uh, I've been doing this in is called the Global Brain Institute. And there is another video explaining how technological singularity and global brain is, is getting to this picture. If you see some of my earlier presentation about the evolution of cities and so, I can actually start creating a, a strong argument about the awakening of Gaia and uh, how we are actually adding a new top species on top of us. That we've been doing that all the time. I mean, it, it, the, 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 the more uh, natural world is that anarchistic uh, anarchy world, right? Where anything can go. So as soon as we start cultivating, creating culture, we, actually, we are actually uh, moving towards this uh, next level of hierarchy. So we've been doing that as long as our society exists. But I think the, the end game here we are halfway, it seems, is um, the awakening of Gaia. Okay, if it's too far, yeah, well. <laughs> um, looking at a concrete example may actually get you a little bit better understanding. I hope you didn't stop the video now. <laughs> um, so I will actually uh, look uh, in a concrete case how this digital wolf creates this tropic cascade to digital talent how that led to a startup ecosystem, a business startup ecosystem, and it has a very clear agile culture. And I will uh, demonstrate how the open innovation in the ecosystem was actually self-organizing exactly what the teal organizations are trying to reach. But again, so it's not uh, an actual ecosystem. This is the ecosystem we're dealing with. It's a globalized, interconnected world highly technological mediated but basically talking to everyone in the world so that's 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 happening so how do we deal in that ecosystem let's go into a specific one and the specific one i'm talking about is drupal you see the logo over here for me it's not a coincidence that it looks like a drop because we're going to talk about rivers for me it's no coincidence that it looks like a teal logo Right? All this relates to the sides, guys. I'm, I'm pretty serious about this. The, the sides, guys, and I can show you over case over case in the history of technology, how this sides, guys, is actually um, the, uh, an energy field that is trying to emerge. Okay, concrete. I'll go back to 2002. To the left over here, you see Dries Bertart. He is the founder of Drupal. He is a very good. Uh, software architect, and that's what attracts the, the first people, me included. Um, when I saw uh, Drupal 4.5, I, I just fell in love with the architecture. That for me, it made so much sense. I said, yes, that's the way we, ne we need to create um, uh, websites. That's, that's how it should work. That's the architecture. So many other good developers understood it and were it's, we call it birds of a feather flock together. So we kind of got attracted to this project. And um, one of uh, another person on, on the other end of the ocean, because that, that was in Belgium, in Antwerp, um, was Howard Dean, who wanted to compete in the, uh, for the presidential, comp he competed in the presidential campaign. He was the underdog because there, there wasn't any, I mean, if, if you look at the, the, the expenses for trying to be uh, a presidential candidate, they are huge. And he was perceived as not having the money. So what he did was very strategically focused on how can I help people raise money and how can we leverage the internet to do so? So that's the grassroots movement that, that started emerging. And of course, they needed a tool. So they looked, the team looked where can we find the tool? And they came to Drupal and said, yes, that's going to be our thing. And so, because, because um, this is actually a big strategic thing, you see suddenly a lot of money being pushed in this project. And that kind of created a split because you had the Drupal community on the one hand and you had Dean Space. It even had a different name, Dean Space. Now, it's an evolutionary split, right? And this happens more in in, in, uh, in um, happens in evolution, but of course it happens in digital uh, 
uh, evolution now as well. And often uh, you see that uh, one of the two would be more fit and the other, like uh, we see with evolutionary branch, would die out, would get extinct. Uh, to make a concrete example, we had Mumble, that was an alternative content management system, and it, um, it split it up in Joomla. So there was a part of the community that didn't like the way the Mumble people were doing it. So they split off in Joomla. And eventually it's the uh, Joomla that, that took over and Mumble that disappeared. In the same way, you see that um, uh, Joomla, Drupal, actually the, the, the biggest one at the moment is WordPress. WordPress is, is, uh, is clearly the dominant uh, in, in this uh, setting. So, but focused on Drupal because there was this interesting thing happening. Instead of this forking and dying out of one branch, what actually happened is a spooning. So that, that's, that's very rare in evolutionary terms. What, what we noticed is that in uh, 2005, the Drupal community still was very active. And I want to show you uh, specifically this, this uh, table here, because the first two guys you see sitting here, they are not young, but that's talent. Those are really uh, interesting, talented people. And having a talk with them, that's pretty tough. It's pretty hard because it's going to be about the thing they love. It's, it's, it's very hard to talk to people like this. And if, you, if you're used to um, being on uh, uh, universities, you will actually see it's full with, with, with this kind of people. And they seem to be all kind of um, um, uh, isolated on their own island. But that's because they are so... Um, aligned with the creative field they are working in. Now, the other person uh, you see central in the picture here is uh, Boris Mann, and he's, he's actually an entrepreneur. So he's not a programmer, he's, he's an entrepreneur. He knows about programming, but entrepreneur. And, and that's going to be important for later on. Um, to, to give you some idea of the richness within the ecosystem, you need to see how people um, uh, um, express their love for something as strange as a, techno as, as a, a software tool, right? And there were people creating a bond called the kitten killers. There were people uh, making socks, baking cakes, all kinds of creative expressions because they love the project. And there's this um, company called Node1 in Sweden um, who made this Drupal icon. And in 2008, for uh, the, the, uh, the Paris conference, they did a road trip from Sweden all the way to Paris. Uh, along the way, they talked uh, and, and visited other Drupal uh, startups. And it eventually led to an interesting uh, merger between those companies that, that's now called Wunderkraut. And um, I'm going to talk a bit later because... Um, 2005, 2008, everything seems to be still um, very nice and beautiful. And I'm going to talk a bit about how this uh, led to um, digital wolf changing digital rivers. And in this sense, you will see that the, the role Dries was playing at that time uh, was very important. First of all, he made the, the lead developer of Dean Space become the, the new release manager for Drupal 5. So that's the first river. That's how this spooning river happened. It's, it's a very strategic, very architectural view as an entrepreneur to software engineering. So you need to combine the skills of, of being a very good uh, software architect and a, 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 an entrepreneur together to, to be able to, to, to reach this. The second uh, case uh, is the multilingual river and that's when Drupal 5 moved to Drupal 6 and um, I can go into more detail because that actually happens on my watch and what I mean with that is we were organizing Drupal conference in Brussels in 2006 and, and we I mean me Dries and uh, Boris so those were three uh, uh, people creating it and um, we sold out in 14 days. So the 150 people was basically because the, the space was limited and we had to um, uh, decline a lot of people who wanted to come. So if I can do an estimate, I think it's something between at least 200 and probably 300 people that would have been able to, uh, would have wanted to come to the conference, but that, that didn't happen. 
Now, it's in Belgium, right, and Brussels, and we had some uh, people from the government, and uh, they have looked at Drupal and tried to use it to, uh, to, for their purpose. But of course, Belgium multilingual um, is a very important issue, uh, uh, aspect, and uh, the Drupal 5 couldn't do it. There were several modules there, but there, it appears that there was like a conflict between those models. So uh, we had a, a very technical discussions for 20, 30 minutes. It, it, was, it was going on and, and we, we, we simply uh, started understanding like, okay, it's too complicated. We are not capable of, of solving that. And Dries at that time said like, you know what? Let's have a meeting in two hours. Spread the word in the conference. Everyone who wants to get multilingual to core should come. Now, personally, because I'm, I'm, I'm just experiencing all that there, I thought like it was, that, that's a way to actually just stop the, the discussion and start doing something else because it was going, it was in a deadlock. But two hours later, to my surprise, it was a big room filled with people and um, a few of them was talent. Most of them were the entrepreneurs. And that's kind of was surprising to me. I mean, the, the, the way they, they, they were capable of, of, of tackling problem, uh, creating milestones, uh, uh, putting on a roadmap during that meeting, that, that you, you saw the whole open innovation deploying before you, right? And what is important is that Dries, because he, he was a PhD student at that time, and he wasn't allowed to have its own company, he was just the mediator, mediating this whole thing. And that's an important thing because that's going to change and uh, make a, a big difference later on. So um, after the meeting, the developers would go out in breakout rooms and they would start uh, doing uh, the, the foundational codes, uh, the architecture of it. And while the entrepreneurs would start talking to each other to figure out how are we going to finance this. So that's an important thing. It's the entrepreneurs who were capable of financing it. And in that sense, they are this keystone species because the plants would not be able to grow with the talent wouldn't be able to grow if they wouldn't get the, 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 the context to do so. So the entrepreneurs were very important here. And that made me very interested in this, uh, this, this uh, startup ecosystem. So I started investigating who are all the companies, uh, who are the entrepreneurs, uh, and had like uh, depth interviews with them. So I, I, I guess I got the most between 2005 and 2010, and that's when, when there is like a turning point. Um, and um, the, so those are their logos. You can look them up if you want to. Probably they, they um, I don't know if they are, exist still like this. Uh, but when I asked them, when I got these deep, deep interviews, I asked them like, okay, so well, what do you think, why are you doing open innovation? First, first, I actually captured the whole narrative of why are they doing entrepreneurship like they are doing. So you can read the, those narratives in my PhD. You can send you the link. I'll, I'll make sure that the, the, the link to the PhD is in, in the, the explanation. And um, so, uh, first of all, none of them knew about open innovation. That was a surprise. There was another book called uh, Crossing the Chasm that appeared to be a very uh, well-known narrative within the, star, within the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, but open innovation, never heard of it. And when I explained it, they thought it was a bad idea. We're not going to do that. So then I confronted them like, it's happening. So why is it happening? And we, when we dig deeper, the essence was because the talent. They understood that um, there they were teams of like a dozen people, mostly not more than a dozen people. So the, the question was like, um, how do you as a startup like uh, leverage this? And what you saw is that because they had like the specific talent, for example, to scalability, right? Uh, which is an important thing for, for the bigger clients. So if you have then someone who can go really deep into this, this problem of scalability, then you have a competitive, competitive hard to trade, competitive advantage. And that's what we know from strategic management. That's what you need to, to, to win the game. So they, they actually knew as entrepreneurs how to play the game. But because it's like they needed each other, like, like a hunting party of wolves to get down the elk, that's the way they, they tackled it. So they, they 
the, the way they solve problems for bigger companies was to, to coordinate the effort. But it was very pragmatic. It's basically because the talent they needed to actually get the project going was in another uh, uh, startup. So very pr pr uh, pragmatic. Now, um, I can tell you that uh, with, with all the interviews I did, the, the probably the most innovative of all the projects was this development seat over here, um, below, right? And um, development seat was uh, the first big organization to leave. I think it, it was around 2011, 2012 that they really finished off and, and went out of the ecosystem. It was a pretty surprised. And the other thing is that the, the biggest one that you, you see in the center is Acquia. Acquia is the, uh, uh, the, the startup from the founder and that was only um, um, well, I think actually it's finalized late 2009. It really became operative only in 2010. So Acquia wasn't really a startup in the incubation phase of the ecosystem. They will actually help the whole ecosystem to scale up. And therefore, you actually see, because you're going to this next level and you get these uh, corporates in, um, they want this, this execution nurse. They want to. They, they want. They want the agile culture, but they want the agile culture in a way that they can direct it. And the thing is, talent doesn't really allow that. Well, it's it's it's. Think about um, well, woody plants don't. I mean, they they like to grow in all kinds of directions. So so many of that talented developers and those more uh, pioneering um, entrepreneurs just uh, left. Um, and um, the thing is that scales, scale matters, right? So if you look at uh, 2006, where we had 150 people, and here is London, 2,700 people, that's a multi, uh, multiplied with 10. Um, we, and that's Europe. If you go to the States, it's uh, twice the number. So there we had conferences with 3,000 people. And because the corporates really start like the big money tries to, 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 to squeeze it in a certain direction, the whole dynamics of the ecosystem uh, changed. And we move from these uh, digital wolves who leave and we get more and more this coyote kind of version uh, only. So we actually, I actually saw how Drupal moved from uh, a rich ecosystem to a barren landscape from an innovative point of view. And uh, if you, you don't need to believe me, Forge, just look at the numbers. Look, um, after Drupal 6, how long it took to go from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, and how long it took to go from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. And now with Drupal 8, you see that there's there this whole structure of um, to, 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 to go to a next level automatically. But for me, it, it sounds, I, I see very little um, richness like diversity in there and I see a lot of uh, uh, being able to 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 guide the, the whole thing so um, what you saw that this um, this new corporate structure was doing is called a war on talent but what I've tried to explain before is that talent itself cannot be at war because they are so deep in that creative space and they're basically everything is infinity. So, so they, 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 they can keep on creating in creative space. You, you just create more space for it. So the, the, the whole idea that you create a war on talent is kind of a strange thing. So the way you can compare that is like, um, um, I mean, think about the wolf in a cage. I mean, the wolf in a cage doesn't behave like the wolf in the wild. The wolf in the cage will not um, change the river. So I've seen some of them uh, flee and others getting caged. And they weren't happy when, I, when I've noticed that. I mean, I've, I've seen in around 2012, uh, when, I, when I kind of uh, took a little bit of distance with the, the Drupal community, I saw a lot of these talented entrepreneurs being very unhappy. There you go. Um, so let's get back to the story river and understand like, okay, so you're trying to add that on top of it, but 
the way you're doing it can actually push out that uh, talent and um, um, uh, those wolves. So, because it, they are not uh, confirming themselves. But if you kind of are capable of having a few of them, you can actually create this uh, more enriched structure. So you simply, you don't need them to be the, the dominant species in the ecosystem. Try, like I said, I mean, if you think about um, a dense forest, it's barren, it's also barren, it's very dark, right? There's no richness either. So what you need is a certain uh, percentage of this free um, 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 wolves that, so that they can, they can exactly do the, the, the tropical cascade, what, what is needed. So the, the thing we need to start augmenting to the, the, the narrative on scaled agile is add that uh, spiral dynamics in there. Don't push out the complexity, but embrace the complexity and figure out how we can actually uh, start uh, adding more of these architectural structures to it. So, so how do we, can I, do you, well, no, I don't have another slide, but I, I want to, to finish up with, with this slide again. So what, what I actually really interested in is how do we go to this tropical cascade of architects? How do we start really um, integrating the zeitgeist? How do we do that? And I think that today with, with big challenges like climate change or renewable energy and all the things, this is, is bound to happen. I mean, uh, those people who, who can actually figure out of how to make that work, they will, they, will, they will win the game. And so that's where I want to wrap up and I hope you've enjoyed this uh, talk. If you do, please subscribe reach out, ask questions, whatever works, right? Whatever. Ayahuasca.